Okay, the peg system. So it might be the case that you need to memorize an ordered list of something. This is number one, this is number two, number three. Uh, it might even be the case that you have to memorize uh, a number, like a telephone number. Maybe it's an important telephone number you have to memorize. Or let's say for some reason you're really nerdy or you're really bored and you want to memorize the value of pi to 10 digits or some other math uh, constant or something like that. Well, you can use the peg system. And this is going to be a little hard to explain. And um, this takes some practice. So if you want to know more, search uh, online for some information on this. If you have to memorize numbers or ordered lists um, in your studies or in your job someday. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't worry too much about it, but if you do have to do a lot of that kind of memorization, lists and numbers, the PEG system can be helpful. Now, there are different versions of PEG system out there. Uh, I'm going to share one version. So PEG is kind of like a, 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 something like a wooden kind of round wooden thing that you can use as kind of like a a large straight hook like peg hooks you see there for like hanging your hats or your coats so those are pegs those uh, wooden things kind of like long straight wooden things there's a peg toy maybe you played with that as a child the, the one on your on the bottom left in the bottom center you see something called peg board which is a kind of material you put hooks or pegs in there then you, then you hang stuff like you Organize for organizing things like hanging your tools or something, pegboard. And the thing on the very bottom right, uh, Americans call that a clothes pin, P-I-N, or clothing pin or clothes pin for hanging clothes on a clothesline to dry. The British call that a peg. British call it a clothes peg. So American is clothes pin, British is clothes peg. So peg is something where you hang something or something used for holding up something. So uh, a peg, uh, if you've got a, like numbers or a list, you're going to create kind of like a, a visual peg. So every time like one is going to be like this visual peg and you create a visual image um, to associate what you need to memorize with your standard visual peg for that number. All right, let me explain. Uh, and by the way, um, there are different peg systems out there. Um, the one I'm presenting you is one from this book. This is what we had to buy when I was a teenager. Uh, I don't know if this one is available in Korea, but there are other books like this on memory techniques, mnemonics. They may have a different peg system. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you use this one or whatever. Uh, just whatever works. Okay, so um, these authors, the, their peg system that they presented is this. So you turn each number into a particular consonant sound. So one is going to be T or D. I mean T and D are similar. Uh, two is N and so on like this. And so you're going to use that like for example if you have to memorize and you so we forget vowels. Vowels are not really um, used for this. You create uh, consonant associations between each number and then one or two similar consonants. And then you are going to kind of create word associations with these consonant letters. So, for example, uh, let's say you're memorizing the value of pi to 10 digits or 20 digits for some reason. What you're going to do is each letter in the series of the value of pi. So, for example, the three is easy. Maybe you need to include that in your mnemonic, maybe not, but okay, one for one. So the one is going to correspond to a T or D, the four is going to correspond to an R, the one T or D. So five is an L, nine is a P or B, and so on. So then you convert this to a sort of an expression mnemonic, like the expressions we saw earlier, like every good boy deserves fun or fudge. Uh, and I've tried to do with this pi, I can't really think of a good mnemonic for pi uh, using this particular peg system. But if you needed to learn this, you'd, you would maybe turn these, you would turn the digits of pi into words and then make a sentence to help you remember. Uh, I have not tried seriously with pi, but you could do that if for some reason you really needed to or had to. Uh, and again, it, if you first had to become really familiar with this peg system, it takes some practice first to kind of learn this. 
pig system, but once you do, it is really useful and helpful. Uh, now let's, so that's kind of for just memorizing numbers. For ordered lists, what you do is you turn each of these uh, consonant values into a regular word, and these words are going to be sort of your peg every time. Every time you memorize a list, you're going to associate the items on that list with these peg words. So one is tie, like a necktie. Two, uh, the book suggests Noah, the fictional character from the Bible, Noah. Uh, or, you, and again, they're Americans, so that's why. They're not necessarily religious, but it's kind of culturally familiar. Uh, you can find some other word that starts with N and just a vowel, uh, like no. Imagine saying no, somebody saying no. Uh, three is ma, like mother, ma, mom. Four is rye, which is a kind of bread. And so maybe instead of rye, you might, you might find something else. Rye is kind of familiar to Americans and Europeans. Uh, rye bread is kind of like a heavy grain bread. Uh, it has a very special taste. It, makes wor it works for us. It may not work for you. Five is law. And you think of like a police officer representing law, so a police officer for a law. Six is shoe. Seven is cow. Uh, and you can imagine that seven is like the K or the G sound, so seven kind of looks like the, the letter seven. The number seven kind of looks like the uh, angular part of the K, for example. Uh, eight is IV. Uh, a vine. Nine is B, and you think of like the the letter nine kind of looks like the letter B turned around. And then for uh, and then zero is S or Z, and so for ten you combine them T and then the S or Z and toes, and you would go on for uh, eleven could be I don't know toot the sound of a train toot or something like that. Uh, Twelve could be like T N. Find a word, make a think of a word with T N that you can easily remember. All right. So when I need to memorize a list of something, I, I've I've pre because I've practiced these, I've used these for a long time. I, these are kind of I, I know these. I know one is Thai. I know two is Noah. I know three is Ma. So uh, I've practiced these, so these are stuck in my mind. So when it comes to memorizing an actual list, I create a visual association between the list item and the peg. Let's say. I want to memorize the characteristics of mammals for a biology test. Uh, let's just take um, a few common characteristics. Um, they have hair or fur, so I think of a neck, my necktie suddenly growing a lot of hair and fur. Okay, crazy, silly visual images. They work. They really work. They help you remember. Uh, two, sweat glands. We, we sweat. So think of Mr. Noah. It could be the biblical character, or maybe you have a friend named Noah, or some other word within, um, suddenly sweating a lot, S sweating so much that it, it's just pouring sweat, something silly. Uh, you can even connect these images so that the tie is growing a lot of hair or fur, and then you kind of uh, zoom out and you see, oh, the, it, Mr. Noah is wearing a tie, and he's suddenly sweating a lot. And then three, mammals have uh, mammary glands for producing milk, so maybe then you see Mr. Noah's wife as a mother, and she's nursing her baby, uh, uh, feeding her uh, her baby, uh, breastfeeding the baby. And then uh, four, uh, the three middle ear bones. We have three little bones in our ears in the middle ear. So imagine then, I don't know, maybe Mrs. Noah, while she's feeding the baby, sticks a, a loaf of rye bread into Noah's ear and pulls out three bones and whatever. Uh, three ear bones, rye bread, and then she. Uh, then the next one is mammals have this neocortex. It's kind of the high brain, the the advanced brain part. The neocortex is kind of part of the brain. So imagine then a, a police officer comes to the scene and he opens up his head and you see his neocortex, uh, and he takes the bread and he gives it to uh, a shoe. And the next characteristic, so shoes are peg. And the shoe has a lot of teeth. Okay, it's silly, but imagine the police officer gives the rye bread to a shoe, and the shoe opens its mouth with a lot of teeth and eats the bread up. Uh, and then it runs over to some uh, IV. IV is our next peg, I think. And next to the IV, you see a heart beating. 
so the next characteristic of mammals is a four-chambered heart, heart with four sections. Uh, so you would practice this, practice this and rehearse this a few times, not just one time, but you need to practice this. First you need to do a lot of practice to memorize the pegs. But once you've got the pegs down, you remember, you remember the pegs, you can then remember a list of items. And you can easily use this for multiple things. Uh, I can use this on one test and create um, a set of visual associations to remember the, you know, the different characteristics of mammals. And then another set of associations to remember um, the biological characteristics of flatworms, and then roundworms, and then fish, and so on. So you can use this multiple times. And I can still more or less do this. I haven't used it a lot in recent years, but I can still do it if I really need to because I learned it so well and I rehearsed it so much when I was young. So again, if you are interested in this, it's maybe a little hard to explain. Get a, a, one of these mnemonic books. It doesn't have to be this one, but there are others you can find that will present some version of the PEG system. It will be maybe different, but it works. Uh, practice it and use it, or you can maybe find some YouTube videos that might show you how to do this too. Um, using this, it takes practice. You have to rehearse each uh, particular list multiple times to remember it, but it will probably stay in your memory longer than if you just do rote memorization. So it takes some practice um, to learn how to use the peg, and it takes practice for each particular list that you're memorizing, or each particular number you're memorizing. Okay. Next, we'll get into sound-alike mnemonics. So the PEG system is something you might find useful or interesting, or maybe not, depending on what you need memorization techniques for. The next one you probably will find useful, and you may have used some of these on your own. Sound-alike mnemonics. You find um, a phrase or words that sound sort of like what you're trying to remember, and especially if it's something silly or unusual or strange that really helps you to remember because again the mental connections you have more mental connections between different things and that helps you to remember so we saw an example actually earlier with the face mnemonics like reginald barclay register broccoli this is kind of what you're doing you're finding sound alike words something funny and it's especially useful for learning new words in a foreign language now, for learning English vocabulary, it's not good if you rely on a lot, a lot on rote memorization. You're not going to remember it. The best thing really is if you expose yourself to a lot of reading in English, and a lot of media materials in English, and you encounter new words regularly, and you encounter a particular new word uh, multiple times in multiple contexts, and that's really a good way to learn vocabulary, um, assuming you're able to figure it out figure out what it means in context. But when you do have to memorize words, a sound-alike mnemonic, see if you can find a sound-alike expression that's really helpful. Some examples, I found these uh, on the web, uh, a, a linguist suggested these for learning Hebrew, apparently this linguist used these for learning Hebrew. In Hebrew, the word for tent is ohel, so this linguist suggests thinking, oh hell, there's a raccoon in my tent. Uh, it works. Uh, Hebrew, bayit, house. That's a lovely house. I'd love to buy it. Okay, that works. In this case, it, it involves a, maybe a whole phrase. Uh, not just an expression corresponding directly to the word, but a whole phrase. And that's fine too. Uh, an example for learning English, and maybe you could suggest some or tell me some that you've come up with for learning English. One time a student of mine shared how she, when she was younger, like middle school, she memorized the English word suddenly by th associating it with sagani, uh, which means rotten tooth. So you create a kind of mental picture to go along with it. So there's a visual component to a visual mnemonic. Uh, so you, you, I guess you imagine your, your teeth suddenly going rotten, going bad very suddenly and very quickly. And it sounds silly, but because it's silly, it works. A few other exam a few examples. Uh, some of these are from a friend of mine. Um, in German, goodbye is auf Wiedersehen. You can think of it as our feet are the same. Our feet are the same. 
the Russian phrase for goodbye is da svidania, and me and my friend came up with the mnemonic: dogs spit on you, dogs spit on you, da svidania, dogs spit on you. Imagine dogs spitting on you. It works. Uh, the crazier, the sillier it is, the better it works. Or if it's very dynamic, a lot of movement, motion, that works too. Let me share with you what I learned, what I use for Korean. In, for Korean, I use a common, I often use sound alike and mnemonics, often in combination with pegs. So Korean has a lot of regular syllables, uh, a lot of, well, a lot of syllables that occur fairly frequently. And so I make pegs for each one of those syllables. And especially for something like ke, 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 um, it, it's really hard for me to remember which ke it is when I learn a new word. I have to use sound alike and peg. So let me show you what I do for Korean. Uh, for, for the first ke, no matter what it actually means in the word, I'll think of crab. <clears throat> so the first one is crab. Because okay, it can mean crab, it can mean a lot of other things, but I'll just use crab as sort of a visual peg. And then the second K is chicken. So no matter what it actually means in the word, uh, I'll use chicken for this one. And then the last K is dog. <coughs> so crab, chicken, and dog. And so these are pegs, and I use a, a sound alike um, or a visual mnemonic for these. So for example, chipke. For jipke, which is like tweezers or tongs, I imagine a crab using its pinchers like um, tweezers and picking up a small house. Jipke, jipke, a crab picking up a house with his uh, <coughs> tweezers, just like a pair of tweezers. Chicken, uh, so for example, geyak, geyakso, contract. I imagine a chicken like this. This is a uh, famous cartoon chicken from American culture. Uh, so I imagine this particular chicken, he's signing a contract and in exchange for the contract signing, he's being, being given a lot of drugs. Gay yak. So yak is my peg for yak is of course drugs. Gay yak. So I imagine, so I remember gay yak that way. Dog. So gay bal. Bal is my peg for bal is of course foot or feet. So I imagine a dog developing new feet. Gay bal to develop. So I mentioned a dog growing, developing new feet. Uh, and I've created visual pegs like these for a lot of Korean syllables. It's often the only way I can remember Korean words. It's so hard for me to remember Korean vocabulary. Maybe for you it's hard to remember English vocabulary. Another example. Uh, so recently I had to learn the word jibu for pay, payment. Um, so I think of ji, ji ne, the, the centipede creature, ji, imagine, and bull, fire. So I imagine I'm at a restaurant and I'm going to the cash register to pay the bill. And so I am, hand the bill to a giant, <coughs> to a giant centipede who is working the cash register and, I don't know, the, the register is on fire or, or the centipede is on fire or something like that. So centipede and fire, jibu. That's how I remember payment now. <clears throat> so I have these pegs for probably a lot of Korean syllables and that's how, and I use that along with sort of visual sound alike mnemonics. So the sound alikes, sound alike mnemonics you use in conjunction with visual imagery, with a visual imagination. Next we come to spatial mnemonics and these may or may not be useful to you, but someday it might be useful. Um, if you're walking along a new route and you need to remember where you came from, pay attention to certain landmark, landmarks and create a visual image, a visual association there, maybe with maybe a peg, for that was the first landmark that I saw, and the second one, and so on. Uh, but I'm mainly going to talk about a, a spatial mnemonic, mnemonic system. I should say mnemonic, that's a more common pronunciation. Mnemonic system for giving talks. Now, let me first say that for most talks and presentations you're going to give in a classroom or maybe in a company meeting, usually just notes on a piece of paper will be fine. Or if you are using a PowerPoint, 
I don't like PowerPoint, but if you are using PowerPoint, that's kind of your notes. The PowerPoint has your notes in it, so that's kind of like that line. So you may not need any kind of memory devices for a talk that you're um, giving from notes. I mean, don't look at your notes too much, of course, but you can have some short, brief notes in your hand, or the PowerPoint is like your, your lecture notes or presentation notes. But there might be a, a situation where you need to give a special talk. Uh, one where you, of course, you cannot memorize a whole talk word for word. Don't try to do that. You cannot r memorize a word, a talk or presentation word for word. Um, you, if you try, your brain is going to be working really hard while you're actually giving the talk from memory. Your brain is trying to remember the exact text or wording of the talk while focusing on the contents, the ideas, and maybe the audience. And you can't do all of that at once. You can't do that kind of high-level multitasking, mental multitasking between the contents, the ideas that you want to talk about, the meaning you're trying to get across, and then the words and, that you've memorized and the pronunciation of those words while looking at the audience. You can't do it, you'll make mistakes. If you ever have to do that kind of a very special talk or presentation, especially before a large audience, and maybe it, it's not really convenient to just read from notes and look from notes. Uh, I've actually listened to some TEDx talks, so there's TED and there's TEDx, which is kind of a lower level, um, much less professional quality, and sometimes they read from their notes and it's not very interesting the presenter is not really interacting with the audience very well or speaking very, very fluently because he or she is spending too much time looking at notes. So if you find yourself in this situation someday, a special a talk you have to give, a special public speaking event, you can use this kind of ancient, it's an ancient spatial mnemonic, goes back to ancient Roman senators and orators, that is professional speakers what they call in Latin, in Old Latin they pronounced it loci, that's from locus, like location, uh, that mean, loci means places, locations. Or you might use this word in modern English in certain technical mathematical contexts and what they would say loci, uh, Latin it's loci, it just means places. So this is how Roman senators and orators would memorize an important talk. They would imagine, for example, uh, kind of walking through your, your house or your apartment and maybe, and you create visual mnemonics for each part of your talk and connect it with that part of your house or your apartment. So maybe you go in the front door and that's your introduction. You create some visual image there. Uh, so where you're giving the talk, you are thinking of your house and these visual mnemonics. And you think of what kind of weird image you put at your front door and you walk in and there's maybe the living room and different images around your living room and uh, and then your kitchen and your the first bedroom and the second bedroom and then finally you're going out the door and there's another one there something like that so they use these kinds of spatial mnemonics for remembering the the key points of the talk so you memorize kind of your outline all of, all of your key points not not all of the text of the talk of course so again, this is more for special talks that you have to give. So uh, I used something like this one, one time. I was giving a, sp a special talk. It was in front of a large audience. Uh, I had to m basically memorize. I had to follow the text pretty carefully uh, because they were putting a translation on the screen in Korean for the audience. So I had to follow my, my talk fairly carefully. So I memorized a detailed outline of the talk in order to do this. So what I did was I got into the room and I had time to prepare. I had created uh, some ideas for the different kind of visual images for each part of my talk, for each part of my outline. And so the time I had in the room, in the, this big lecture room, uh, before I actually went up for my talk, you know, I had time to prepare. I had kind of planned out the images for the different parts of my outline. So when I got into the room, I, in my mind, I planted these different images. This image goes here in front of the stage. This image goes over there, this image over there, over there. And I had time to rehearse 
these images, these mental images. So when I get on stage, I'm about to give my talk. Some, it was a talk about uh, misconceptions that uh, Korean students have about learning English. So I started out with kind of a story, an anecdote. It, it was kind of a sort of a cute story about that happened to me one time at a bus stop when someone tried to talk to me in English here. So um, in front of the stage, I had created an image of like a bus or a bus stop to remind me of that story. And that's how I started my talk with that little story. Then over there on that side of the stage was my first main point. Uh, which was, uh, I th think about, um, uh, I think it was about, this was some years ago, it was about eight years ago, uh, but I still kind of remember it because also later on I, I kind of repeated parts of the talk for other uh, smaller audiences. So one of my main points, I put an image in the, in the corner of the room and one of my first main points was about myths and misconceptions about learning a language. So for myth, I thought of a, a statue of some ancient Roman or Greek god or goddess, a myth. A statue of some mythical god. Because I can think of like a, a statue as a symbol for them, some famous statue uh, of, of a Greek god or something. So myths and misconceptions. Uh, the next part was motivation. So another kind of back there, I put, um, I think what I used was a friend of mine, a colleague of mine who I had helped with some motivational issues with English. So I think I put my friend there and then over there was uh, about something about goals. So the next part of my talk was about changing your goals and strategies. So I put goals there. So I mentioned a soccer goal in a soccer ball being kicked into the goal and then strategies well I imagine like you know, like in movies they have this kind of like big planning board where generals have like a big planning board for their battle uh, so I put an image of that over there for strategies so different parts different main corners of the room I put the images for the main parts of my talk and then for sub points in between I put other images for the sub points so uh, uh, myths and misconceptions. I put several other images in between that and the next main point for the different uh, points there for motivation. I imagined my friend coming down the center aisle and there were other images I planted in different parts of the center for different parts of motivation and coming back up uh, and so on. So I had uh, images for the different sub points of my talk. And I was able to give the talk and it looked like I did it naturally and from memory, although one, I was very nervous, but I was rehearsed enough that I wasn't showing my excessive nervousness. Uh, and two, I did it fairly fluently using this kind of uh, low-key mnemonic, the spatial mnemonic. Uh, so that's something you can practice if you ever have to do give like a major talk in front of a big audience without notes, without memorizing your talk. So, um, some of you might have to do that in the future, in some of your jobs or special occasions. So this has been mnemonics, and uh, I hope some of this helps you. The PEG system may or, not, may not, may or may not be useful uh, to some of you. The spatial mnemonics might be useful to some of you someday when you have to do special talks. But the sound alike mnemonics, that's something you can easily practice and learn a lot and use a lot for learning vocabulary in another language or other words that you have to memorize. Uh, I think next time we'll start moving more into a very short, maybe we'll have to shorten it if it's all online, but a little bit about communication skills, for example, for workplace settings. And then we'll start looking at a little case study of a particular business uh, or company and have you practice with some um, case studies because for your final presentation, you're going to do sort of practice job interviews. So your midterm interview was sort of for a scholarship application. Your final is going to be sort of more of a job interview practice, job interview type of um, Thing, a simulated job interview. 
So we're going to start talking a little bit about company culture, and workplace culture, workplace English a little bit, um, and analyzing companies, thinking about where, where would you like to apply for a job, what kind of company would you like to work for. Uh, and so we'll start moving more towards that uh, later on. So until then, hope you have a good time. It's challenging, but a, a fairly enjoyable time doing your midterm interview preparation and recording it. And I look forward to grading your midterms and look forward to getting into the next unit. So I'll see you later. Goodbye.